Happy politics and welcome to yet another fun-filled jam-packed edition of BC Poly Hot Stove. I'm the editor-in-chief of this very fine website, uh, The Orca. My name is McLean Kay and I'm joined in a socially distant manner by... From the bastion of COVID in British Columbia. <laughs> On the border of the Fraser Health and Vancouver Coastal Health Authorities, it's Jordan Bateman. ICBA Vice President Communications, coming to you from the front lines of the fight against the pandemic, the shutdown, uh, Lower Mainland. Uh, well, I Sh mean, shut down a jinx. That's right. I mean, and th this is one time where our uh, this is not where we're going to start. We no. we should talk about COVID after. Yes. But I mean, where I am, there's no restrictions. Well, other uh, than, yeah. you know, well, aren't you just wonderful? Isn't Vancouver <laughs> Island great? Surrounded by water, blah blah blah. <laughs> and uh, those of us here in, uh, in the what John Horgan clearly believes to be a hellscape, uh, you know. <laughs> no, let, let's talk about it after. I want to talk about something yeah. else because um, I want to trademark a term into um, the free enterprise coalition world. But I don't want to have to actually bother having to write it because I am swamped on other things. So here it is. Are you ready? All right, let's go. Let's hit me. McLean, I believe we have a new name for what has happened to the BC Liberals in this election. And we call it the snap. Now, for those of you not watching it, uh, not watching this, but uh, listening at home, I am wearing an Infinity Gauntlet, the all-powerful uh, receptacle of the Infinity Stones used by the evil Thanos in the third Avengers movie um, to snap half of the uh, known universe out of existence. He was a bit of an eco-fascist. He didn't believe the universe could handle all these, uh, these beings uh, in it. So he snapped half of them out of existence, including Spider-Man, uh, which still breaks my uh, daughter Indy's heart watching Tom Holland slowly dissolve into nothing. Uh, Mr. Stark, I don't feel so good. Oh, and then he's gone. But McLean, it occurs to me, I'm just gonna put uh, this here for this conversation. Uh, there we go. This is one episode you definitely want to have yeah. on YouTube and not Spotify. Yeah, and I know what you're wondering. How does he have these fancy <laughs> things? Where does he get all these wonderful toys? Well, anyways. <laughs> Look, the snap has been bad for BC Liberal land and for free enterprise in general. Much like Thanos snapping away uh, half the uh, known universe, uh, John Horgan snapped away uh, half the seats with his snap election. Uh, yes, I'm comparing him to Thanos. And... <laughs> The hope I want to bring today to uh, BC Liberal folks, uh, Liberal Conservatives across the province is this. We know who won in the end. They came back together, the Avengers, went back in time, saved the universe. Everyone reappeared after uh, five years of decimation. We're, we're going to make it four years uh, here. And uh, what is now commonly referred to as the blip, it's like it never happened. And the side note is, now those people who were blipped away actually aged in those four years, which is, uh, or five years, which is a nice side effect for those of us who are getting older. Mm -hmm. Anyways, all this to say, reading uh, BC Liberal uh, or you know Free Enterprise Facebook groups, there is a deep gnawing despair at this point. Um, I think we've moved into that stage of the grieving process. I think there is a lot of, uh, still some anger. Uh, there's a lot of questions about what and how and why and what to do next. Uh, McLean, you've been writing several pieces from very interesting writers um, on this. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah, it's, the, the snap has been bad, but, you know, nothing is forever. And this is always a tough thing to say, right? Like, no, Margaret Thatcher, I think, quite a, no victory is final, no defeat is forever. You know, mm -hmm. there is an opportunity here um, to come back together to figure out what the values are for this, uh, you know, the party that's going to represent this kind of group of people going forward and to find better ways to connect with the voters. So all is not lost. The snap is just a snap. Um, things can come back. Yeah, is, uh, if, if you're a BC Liberal watching this or listening, uh, hopefully you're watching again because, you know, Jordan's got an amazing golden glove on his desk. Um, Infinity which, Gauntlet. Yeah, that's, yeah, that too. Um, <laughs> There's a it's a it's a bit of a balance to strike in that you, you want to be realistic and alive mm -hmm. to the situation and what happened in the election and the trends that led into that and all that. But also not to, you know, just give up and believe that it's permanent. Um, that's because you're right. I mean, that it's you, you don't have to look very far in this province or anywhere else to see examples of elections where things have swung one way or the other, uh, you know, just in four years. And so. You know, to for, I, I don't think the NDP are sitting in the premier's office in the West Annex, the legislature saying, well, great. These seats are ours now forever. Yeah, um, they're they're not that they're not that arrogant. I don't think 
And so, I mean, the, the opposition shouldn't think that either. Yeah, I think your uh, piece today advised uh, the, the new NDP Chilliwack MLA to uh, rent, not buy. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> which is, <laughs> I mean, surprisingly like... cheeky of you, sir, but very accurate. I mean, look, uh, Gwen Omani would uh, maybe sublet her place. It's the same writing, essentially, yeah. right? I mean, it's uh, renamed, but yeah, it's, it, I mean, I, 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 I felt, I, I didn't want to highlight that writing only because, you know, there's a danger of saying, well, you know, this one was a fluke, so the election was a fluke. The election was not a fluke. They were going to win that election. But that writing in particular, there was, I mean, I said it, 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 it has an asterisk because the, you could never recreate the circumstances that led to that particular win there um, with, a, you know, an independent candidate, a B.C. liberal candidate who was no longer a B.C. liberal candidate about halfway through the campaign. And yeah. I mean, it, it was a mess. Yeah. Um, but that said, yeah, that's um, uh, yeah. And, uh, Kelly Patton is her name. Yes. And look, there's, you know, OK, so I, w- what are the B.C. liberals down to? 27 writings? 27? Uh, is it? Tw- I thought it was 29, 29? but I'm terrible. Okay, whatever it is. 27, 29. It, it, you yeah. know, you, they're going to need to make up 15 or so, 15 to 20 in order to win next time. Mm-hmm. Now, in good news, there are going to be many seats that have been traditionally held by the center right. So we can go back to the last decimation, which was 2001 and of the NDP, when they were driven down to two seats. And everyone said, oh, it's the end of the NDP as we know it. My phone is ringing. Apologies, folks. It's the end of the NDP <laughs> as we know it. Uh, the world is uh, all ending. Uh, what a terrible, horrible thing. They'll never come back. It's time for a new you know, left-wing coalition. What are they going to blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, they didn't come back all the way to the first election, but they did move from two seats, I think, into the low 30s. Yeah, so, which is know, astonishing. Led by Carol James, who you know, is yep. retiring this week as finance minister. Okay. How did they do it? Well, there was a bunch of seats that flipped to the BC Liberals in 2001 that were traditional NDP seats and with a, in a traditional you know, closer campaign are bound to swing, were bound to swing back. Uh, we all remember the immortal Susan Bryce uh, MLA in Victoria, right? Like, uh, you know, that was clearly a riding that we weren't, you know, the BC Liberals weren't going to hold for the long term. And sure enough, uh, they, they didn't. The same, is, uh, the same is happening here. You know, that Chilliwack riding, a couple of Abbotsford's riding, I would argue Langley East and Langley, Surrey Cloverdale. There are a number of these ridings, even, uh, you know, the Maple Ridges, although the gap widens slightly, um, are traditional center-right seats. And through vote splits or weird circumstances and, you know, the COVID bump, uh, the helium that was brought to the uh, NDP ticket up through that, um, they flipped this time. But they are very likely to flip back. The great thing for the next leader of the BC Liberal Party, or whatever it's called at that point, is that you have very winnable seats with no incumbent candidates. And you can go out there and you can handpick your team, you can recruit properly, you can find those millennials that Gavin Dew is always lecturing us to go out and find. You can find those <laughs> mythical unicorn candidates who you know, check 17 different diversity boxes. Like you can go out and do the work, find the best candidates to win those ridings and bring them in. A completely fresh, you know, new set of faces in 10, maybe 15 pretty winnable ridings next time. Yeah. Not to mention retirements. I mean, I don't think anyone thinks Shirley Bond's going to run in four years. Mike DeYoung, I don't think, is going to run again in four years. Um, you know, there's, there's going to be writings like that are held as well. Yeah. Mike Morris, I think, you know, I'm not sure he's going to be around another four years. Mike Bernier, like, there's a whole group of, like, there's going to be a lot of transition and switch over if you do it right. Um, so that is the opportunity. That is why, and we can transition to talking about this, whoever is the next leader of the party needs to be, first and foremost, um, a talent evaluator and recruiter, someone who can go out there and close the deal with potential candidates to run for the party, the candidates they want. The kind of person like Gordon Campbell famously tells the story about going and finding Bill Bears off and turning that into a safe uh, BC Liberal riding because he found the one guy who could really build that, that center there. You know, the same thing that you hear about Christy Clark and you know, Mike McDonald going out and getting Peter Fassbender for Surrey Fleetwood. Um, you know, people that can actually win those ridings um, and hold them for the long term. So, you know, when you're checking the boxes, you know, and look, uh, the center right is very pragmatic. Uh, I think we want to win. Um, generally, that is the goal of elections is to win them, unless you're, you know, an NDP or a federal NDP, in which the goal of the election is to somehow survive in not worse shape <laughs> than the last election. But if you want to win, that's what you got. You got to find someone who can go out has a different network, has an appeal to a different generation of people, and can bring them into the party. Well, I mean, you're, that is a good seg into the other big story that's going to be playing out over the next few 
months and year, really, uh, and that is whoever the next leader of the opposition is going to be. Um, we uh, we don't have any official, 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 you know, publicly launched candidates yet, but there are people that, you know, everyone kind of knows has all but thrown their hat in the ring. Uh, and, you want to talk about any of them in particular to start? Yeah, my suspicion is we're kind of in a shadow campaign right now. Probably be that yeah. way through Christmas into January. The uh, BC Liberal Party is in no condition or or mindset yet to set out what a new leadership race would look like. Um, I think that's going to get punted to the new year. Those decisions. So there's no rush for these candidates to write, come out. But look, the big three: Kevin Falcon, Todd Stone, Ellis Ross. None of them so are dis- yeah. yeah so far none of them are disabusing anyone of the notion that they're not going to run like they are all out there their teams are out there um, you know there's a little bit of a land rush gold rush on uh, MLAs past and present for support lots of tire kicking uh, all those different uh, all those different um, metaphors that we use in leadership races but you know that is happening and each of them is trying to appeal to their party in a different way Ellis Ross clearly the voice of the current you know or probably most like the current caucus. Northern, um, uh, rural, uh, very up to speed on energy issues, obviously. Um, uh, obviously, Indigenous uh, wants to, uh, you know, kind of reset the party around this kind of inclusive values. You have Todd Stone, the, the Kamloops uh, politician who, uh, you know, I think in his heart of hearts feels like maybe he didn't get a fairer say, airing last time against Andrew Wilkinson. Um, but, you know, kind of that Christy Clark era recruit. And then Kevin Falcon, who was a Gordon Campbell era recruit, uh, you know, former finance minister, former transportation minister. Uh, and former, been, former leadership candidate. Former leadership candidate, didn't win 10 years ago, uh, came a respectful second to Christy Clark. Um, and, you know, someone who, you know, in his mid to late 50s now, um, I think very successful in, in private business, I think still has that itch, that little hook in him for, uh, for political life. Um, you know, a longtime rival of Christy Clark probably mm-hmm. kind of sticks with him a little bit that Christy was premier and he never was. Um, you know, there, there is that kind of dynamic. So those are the three that are sort of most visible right now. But beneath them, there's a whole bunch of people waiting and seeing, like, which one of those, yeah. you know, are all three of those going to run? Um, you know, if they do, you know, could, you know, could I be the outside candidate? They're thinking to themselves, like, you know, if you've got three sort of internal folks, is there room for you know, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth person to come up? There's newbies to the, the party, new members of caucus who might see it as an opportunity to kind of introduce themselves more broadly to the BC Liberal membership, kind of yep. Leslie and Lewis their way um, into <laughs> the uh, consciousness of the party. So, you know, there's a lot happening behind the scenes. There's a lot happening behind the scenes and there's nothing happening behind the scenes uh, at the same time. Um, for those of us who have, you know, uh, who've had, uh, had kids, um, uh, Obviously, my wife had them. I, I was just there, <laughs> but you know, you played a supporting uh, role. Yeah, I played a supporting role. But it's that it's like that hurry up and wait of being in labor, where you know you rush to the hospital, everything's happening, and then nothing happens except you know pain and yeah. groans and timing things, and like okay, is this you know? And uh, you, I'm glad you added these stuff after nothing happens, because yes. otherwise, yeah, yeah, yeah well, we would have got family, some angry emails. Well, your family and friends are calling. Should we come to the hospital? Yeah. Should we come? And you're like, well, nothing's really happening. Could we? Could happen in an hour. Could happen in twelve hours. That's where we're, that's the stage we're at. I think in this BC Liberal yeah. leadership race, <laughs> uh, where, the, where it's in. I'm in full of metaphors today. In, I'm full of the, metaphors. The party's in labor. Uh, yes. That's good. The party's in labor after being yes. snapped out of existence. There's a lot. There, there's yes, a lot going sweating, on this week. We're sweating. We're we're uh, groaning. We're stumbling around the the hospital hallways. The nurse keeps telling us to walk. We don't really want to. This is what's happening. <laughs> We yes, really need a shower. Sense. It's know. all coming back to me yeah. uh, cuz I too played a supporting role at best. Um, now, one of the reasons that we're that no one's going to be talking about the leadership campaign uh, I I think certainly this week, maybe even next week is of course since Saturday we alluded to it off the top, uh, some tough new uh, restrictions in the lower mainland and just the lower mainland, uh, specifically Vancouver Coastal and Fraser Health uh, for 2 weeks. Um, essentially a, well, not a lockdown, but a, a ban on social gatherings, essentially. And, you know, I'm having trouble parsing what the restrictions are because I, I don't think I was alone. It was shockingly confused and it felt rushed. And, you know, there, there was a lot of, uh, even the people who have tended to be the most deferential to uh, Adrian Dix and Bonnie Henry have, were over the weekend were kind of saying, I, I don't get it. I don't, I don't know what I'm, uh, I mean, 
I support the idea, but am I allowed to have my grandmother over? It's not clear. And um, Adam, you're you're living with it. What was your take on it? Well, I, okay, so it's Saturday afternoon. They've announced that they're going to have this press conference on Saturday, which is exceedingly rare in the last few weeks. Yeah. We've seen five, 400, 500 case days for several days leading up to it. Um, so everyone's kind of, you know, your, your spice, spice sense goes off. Well, you know, something's going to happen. Okay, so we tune in. We're driving to White Rock, uh, my daughter, my wife, and I. Dr. Bonnie comes on CKNW, starts talking, and then inexplicably, about 12 minutes in, CKNW's like, ah, we've had enough, and they cut to uh, the, the Roy Green show, which is a nationally syndicated course show. Uh, okay, so and then we're kind of following a social media. It's not on News 1130. It's not on CBC Radio. So you're like, what, what, what is happening here? This was the single most important press conference of this, you know, in the COVID pandemic in months. Yep. And even the media is so fatigued that they wouldn't just let it play on a Saturday afternoon when all you have is canned content from back east. And it shows you just how fatigued not only we are, but the media are as far as, as what's going on. Also, it shows you that Dr. Bonnie and Adrian Dix and John Horgan are not um, flawless. This was a communications rollout nightmare, a rushed press conference, two people who did not have clear answers or clear statements a lack of having published orders. It was very clear the government caucus, government communications were not working at full, full speed there. It's very clear the public health officer, provincial health officers, communications people were not working at full speed. And then there was a whole, you know, Fraser Health and Vancouver Coastal Health coming out with different interpretations of Dr. Bonnie's rules. Guys, you work directly for her. Pick up the phone and ask, right? But they did it. They instead put out their different rules. That creates this kind of conflict. You know, the Restaurants Association runs races out. Well, you can still come to restaurants. You'll be safe with us because, you know, Dr. Bonnie says we're following the rules. But then you can't really because you can't have social gatherings. This whole myth about you can walk with people who aren't in your group, but you can't, you got to be careful it doesn't turn into a social gathering. What <sighs> the F is that? So you have That's all weird. these things stacking up to the point that I think all day Sunday this went on. Monday, they rush out another press conference. This time... They bring out John Horgan first, who makes his uh, first appearance since uh, right after the election. Um, Horgan essentially blames the public for the, you know, don't you force me to do this. Don't make me do more. <laughs> I Vaughn, will turn this car around. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Vaughn Palmer helpfully points out this morning in the five weeks of his uh, John Horgan's election campaign, cases went up 63%. Uh, outbreaks in long-term care went up 60%. And the number of British Columbians isolating for symptoms went up 57%. So don't make me turn this car around. Well, you're the one who called this snap election, buddy. And you're the one who gave social license. I, it's funny to me how we don't use the term social license in this context. We do with pipelines. We do with mm -hmm. community planning. We do everything else. We don't use social license in this. John Horgan's selfish election call gave social license for everyone in British Columbia to relax. Oh, you know, the guy who's been telling us this is a disaster, the woman who's been, you know, doctoring us through all this, Adrian Dix, who's been, you know, steadfastly by her side and giving us PPE counts every day, every week. They are out there, you know, basically endorsing this campaign as long as it's socially distant. Well, I guess I can do stuff. And there's this social license given for everyone to relax. And now they're shocked that everyone relaxed. Like, it just, this is a big problem. I don't like it. I live in Fraser Health. You know, mm -hmm. we're the ones under the restrictions. We're also the ones most likely to catch this disease right now. Um, I don't want to do either. <laughs> like, but, you know, even if, you know, Horgan will trot out, well, Elections BC says not a single person, you know, not a single case can be traced back to our election. Yeah, that's just the poll workers at the actual place, the people voting. It's the social license you gave to people to go out and do all these different things that is the problem, mm -hmm. Mr. Premier. And it's where you need to take responsibility for once and admit that you had a role in providing the social license and that you, just like the rest of uh, British Columbia, should be uh, looking in the mirror and wondering how you can do better. I mean, you're right. Um, I, I, I want to talk about that, but I also want to go back to, you mentioned the fatigue with uh, yeah. Dr. Henry and Adrian Dix's press conferences. And do you, do you know what it kind of reminds me of? I'm going to, it's my turn for a metaphor. It reminds me of the public fatigue with the space program in the mm. 70s in the US, where, you know, there's the, uh, when they first started sending men to the moon and on the missions, uh, you know, the entire country, the world watched with bated breath because they couldn't believe this was happening. They were watching history. But what NASA found is in a very short amount of time, people stopped watching. 
they had live TV broadcasts from the space shuttle. They, you know, they, they did more and more missions to the moon. And, and eventually they, they stopped even telling the astronauts while they were broadcasting that they had actually shut off the broadcast because people, people didn't care. They wanted to get back to whatever the hell they watched in the 70s. Now, obviously, the, the, the space program didn't affect people's lives in a, a direct and personal way as the pandemic has. But I still feel like it's kind of similar in that people are just tired of it. It's the same show. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the numbers change. And on Saturday, the advice and direction change. But for the most part, it's like they're long. It's it's we don't need a new catchphrase every three days. Um, these press conferences should be Adrian Dix coming up, introducing Dr. Bonnie Henry. She says the numbers. She she gives whatever guidance uh, is pertinent for that day and then takes questions. Uh, but we don't need multiple speeches and, you know, more and more imploring and, and moralizing and um, and lecturing, quite frankly, sometimes because and not because it's not needed, but because people have clearly tuned it out. Yeah. And the what you do when people have tuned you out is you don't double down and just say it for longer and more often. You find new ways. And I, I think that's part of it. I mean, for CKNW to cut out of the most significant uh, Dr. Henry press conference in months is telling. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't think that was someone just randomly flipping the switch. It was another person going, you know what? People aren't listening. They check out. I've stopped listening. Yeah. It's much easier to just uh, follow on social media and then read the press release. Yeah. You don't need 45 minutes of the same questions yeah. and the same you know, attempts at a catchphrase. Of, stay calm, stay calm, uh, stay kind, stay safe. That yeah. worked. And they have tried to duplicate that for months. Oh, Adrian Dix is the worst for this. He has some of the worst counterintuitive things. But you're right. The problem with these press conferences too is they're becoming news release reading. Yeah. That's 317 cases in Fraser Health and 212 cases in Vancouver Coastal and seven cases in Northern Health. Put that in the friggin' paper, like piece of paper. We don't need to know the breakdown from you. No one is recording. No one is clipping for Global News Hour. Dr. Bonnie yeah. saying 317 cases in Fraser Health, 212. No one is doing it. It's irrelevant. I mean, it's relevant, but it's not relevant to yeah. have to get like the point of the press conference is to give the clips that you need for the video journalists in order yeah. to not like everything else can go in the press release. That is the problem. Yeah. What they should do is send out the press release 10, 15 minutes before she speaks. Yeah. Have her go up and say, you've seen the numbers. Yeah. And this is what I think this we need to do. And this is what that means. Yes. And now I'll take your questions. That, yeah. that, that's what these should be. Exactly. That, you're exactly right. So it's become news release reading. Now, the funny thing is, and it's not funny, but the fatigue is clear. Remember when we hit 300 cases a few weeks ago? You know, I remember Linda Steele, you know, if we don't take notice now, we never will, you know. And Linda was right. We all kind of went, oh, I don't know, that's not great. Then it was 400. Then on the, just before the weekend, Adrian Dix was running around doing media ahead of the actual briefing saying, you know, the numbers say are really, really bad. Like, really, really, really bad. If this doesn't shake us out of it, nothing will. And, you know, it was 500 plus. But everyone yawned and, and went on their way. So, it, the formula isn't working anymore. They've no. used it to death. Um, you know, these press conferences now, like, you know, and like, I, I don't want to be hard on reporters because the questions they ask are a product of the lack of clarity they're receiving right now from the PHO and the government. But, you know, Binder Sajan shouldn't have to waste her question to Dr. Bonnie and to the health minister or the premier on, can grandma come with me to the restaurant even if she doesn't live yes. with me? Like, yeah. that is and not, it's not a reflection on Bender. No. It's that, that it's not clear. No, and I'm just picking Bender's name out of hat because she's my favorite. Yeah. And literally my favorite. Sorry, McClay. <laughs> I, I adore her. But like this, like she shouldn't have to do with that, right? Like, you know, it's the tongue clucking of some media members, um, all living in Victoria, all very privileged to have jobs where they can work from home, um, you know, looking across almost kind of looking down across the Salish Sea at the rest of us, like, oh, well, you know what's going on. Like it's where it's all wearing thin and the problem with this is this is the key moment now this is the most important moment since the two-week lockdown turned into six weeks now this is the other question right so i mean i work at uh, a tower near metro town mall i remember you know coming through metro town mall um, in may and seeing signs on shuttered windows saying we'll be back march 31st because remember, we were going to have a two-week yeah. shutdown that became nine, eight or nine weeks. Yep. So, you know, the big questions are, okay, you've said this is a two-week step back. 
what are the outcomes that have to happen at the end of that 14 days in order for you to you know, not extend this further, not go deeper? And that, that's the kind of information that would be helpful here. The truth is, I don't think the provincial health officer knows. I think it's more, she'll hate it, more art than science, these lockdowns right now. And I don't know, like there's so many amateur armchair virologists out there, you know, oh, we should be mandatory masking, we should be doing this and that. And everywhere has experienced it, mandatory masks or not, so I can see why she doesn't. But at the same time, every single, you know, every single press conference is that question. Yeah, no, you're right. And it's, we're not alone. I mean, just as before we went on the air, um, Manitoba announced they were going into what they call code red, which is basically like a full provincial shutdown, mm. uh, lockdown, I should say. And uh, but you're right here. It's been this like steady creep where we were all shocked that, you know, cases are back in the triple digits. Then it was 200. And then, you know, it, I, I, it doesn't seem like that long ago that we were, you know, wringing our hands about 300 cases a day. And now it's a thousand every two days. And mm. Yeah, whatever, to, whatever it is that needs to change, it needs to change. Let, let's talk from an employer point of view. So there was new restrictions yeah. put on employers. Like you got to do the you know, multi-question health check every day of every staff member. Listen, for most businesses, that's irrelevant because we've been encouraging so hard anyone with a symptom stay home. So by the time you get here, it's just another thing to like, it's just, okay. Like, yeah. If you're here, you're here, right? If you're going to do these kind of restrictions, roll them out Friday morning so that your senior executive teams can work on them all Friday afternoon and Friday night, mm. make sure they're in place for Monday. Instead, you do it Saturday morning. You provide no clarity whatsoever Saturday through most of Sunday as to what's happening. They finally post some little things on Saturday, Sunday afternoon, so you have teams scrambling Sunday night to try to put something together for Monday morning. Be smarter. Like, there was no difference. You were going to do this on Friday. You, like, yeah. you like at least prepare the way say hey listen we're gonna have some new guidelines out for a lot of these areas be ready for it um yeah it just it's so clunky right now and i'm not sure if it's because they took their eye off the ball with the election i'm not sure if it's just they're exhausted and they have decision fatigue i'm, not, I'm sure that's i'm sure that plays a big role i'm not sure if their their science is muddled so they don't know what to do i'm not sure if it's like you know political pressure to keep the economy going or schools open. I, I'm not sure what it is or if it's a combination probably of everything. But like, guys, you got to be better. You got to do better than this because you, you basically just won an election based on the fact that you're the best possible managers for this pandemic. And in the process, you gutted the Green Party and any chance you have of working with them. You gutted the BC Liberals and they're not in any hurry to stand up with you and, and whatnot. So you are now the show. You, it's your baby, this is it. It's your show, John Horgan. You had better not screw this up because people's lives are on the line. And right now, it's being screwed up. I don't know how you can say otherwise. The communication yeah. is abysmal. Well, and you're right. I, I read, uh, I don't know if you read uh, Keith Baldry's piece this morning, basically saying, you know, the MLAs have to get back to, uh, to working together now in the face of the pandemic. Bullshit. I mean, that's not, it's not really true anymore. There's a, there's a huge majority government. The the BC Liberals and Greens cannot show up, and it wouldn't look a whole lot different. BC, um, I'm not suggesting they do that, but so, I mean so that I is very know, sort of and, six months ago advice. That just infuriates me. First to know, and the BC Liberals should be out there saying this is not good enough. Like you have got to do yeah. better, Adrian Dix. You've got to do better, Saint John Horgan. You got to do better, Doctor Bonnie. Like people need to know. Clear, clarity. The role, <laughs> the role of the opposition is to oppose, is to find better ways of doing things, better suggestions, better ideas, clarification points. Be the voice for constituents who don't yeah. necessarily agree with the government. And right now, you know, we're in this weird period where, for some reason, John Horgan thinks he's not really even government right now. He could call the, he isn't. There's no magical thing. Like he's the premier. Yeah. The house could sit and, today. And and to your point, there's a way they can do it. Like, I, I don't think anyone's suggesting they they do what the Alberta NDP have done, which is to, you know, call the government using this word liars on an almost day to day basis, which I, I think it just undermines confidence. But I mean, to your point, what you just brought up about, you know, have you considered what it means to employers when you give them vague direction on a Saturday and then clarify it on a Sunday afternoon? It's not workable. No. That is a completely valid and I think constructive criticism of the kind of thing that you, I, I would hope, you know, that you would get from, 
the opposite one of the two opposition parties in addition to you know obviously they're watching bc poly hot stove but yes i mean that, that is a it was a great point yeah well look and you can see you can see the stumbles like for us here at icba we have about 30 employees come to the office we have like sixteen thousand square feet so on you know normal days we hardly see each other let alone more social distancing but you know we change the sign-in forms and there were things like, should we go to a web-based forum? Well, then someone has to check the web-based forum. It's easier if everyone's kind of signing when they come, blah, blah, blah. And we send out communications to staff. Not every staff, not every employee checks their email every day. And certainly not yeah. younger ones, retail ones, you know, like, so they show up with these new protocols. We got accosted in the lobby uh, in our building, the top 50, it's owned by Metro Vancouver, the top 15 or 20 floors are Metro Vancouver bureaucrats. Um, we were accosted by Metro Vancouver Monday morning. You've got to sign in here. I don't work for you. <laughs> like, no, you've got to sign in. Everyone who's in this building's got to sign in. Yeah, we'll sign in upstairs at our workplace. And it was, you know, they were really hostile and rough with us, um, mm. you know, to the point where, you know, if you signed in, you had to put a department. So the Ministry of Silly Walks was referenced. And, you know, we went up and signed in again. Like, but this was, they were panicked because they were trying to like work on the fly with rules that weren't clear. We were like, no, we know what we're doing. Just leave us alone. It, it's, it was a mess. It was a mess. And it was repeated in every workplace in British Columbia. Now, at the same time, you've got government now talking about bringing uh, public servants back. Uh, it's astonishing to me that most aren't back yet. Like most off many offices are, you know, have moved back into spaces um, at least part time. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's it's such a mess. Like it, it is a real mess. It's brought on by the fact that government took their eye off the ball for six weeks to run an election, and it's compounded by the fact that you know the clunky communications roll out. Look, we we had better communications around glory holes and master <laughs> sex than we had on a new lockdown here in the Lower Mainland. That is not, not good enough. And we haven't even touched on the other issue, right? Everything, all these communications are in friggin' English. And, That's a really good point. You know, like there was no Punjabi translation, no Chinese translation, no Korean translation, no Filipino translations of any of this stuff. And so you're relying on ethnic media to get out. Well, the ethnic media aren't working on weekends. And, yeah. you know, the newspapers come out three, four, five, seven days later. Um, okay, so Hajinder Thin on Red FM and Shinder Purwal, our friend, is, you know, probably broadcasting and trying their best to educate um, their listeners on these issues. But, roll it out with these things like and uh, i don't know it just you can't rely like, right. i love social media i'm a social media guy I, i'm yeah. on it a lot you can't rely on social media to reach everyone no no because the the it, there's still a majority of people in this province aren't on those channels like or every day they're channels. certainly not on it every yeah, day yeah exactly that's a really good point and e even if they are on it they're not on it every day okay. um and y you mentioned the issue of translators that is an issue that I am quite frankly surprised the NDP have not been better at that. It seems like the kind of thing that they would get intuitively that like, uh, of course the government should hire, you know, a Punjabi translator should hire a, a full-time tra Chinese translator. I mean, it just seems like, yeah, even if just those two, uh, I would, ar you could argue the case for more, but those two are hugely significant yeah. uh, communities in, in, um, in, how DC, many press conferences, how many press conferences have we heard Adrian Dix recite Dr. Bonnie's numbers in French? Yeah. You know how many people watch Radio Canada's news in BC? It's fewer than 250. I'm being yeah. serious. The rating no, is 0. Right. 0. I know. zero. And we've been subjected to the like eight minute, uh, you know, Adrian Dix translation of the numbers that should be in the press release. It's ridiculous. And, and I, I, French I, I is I promise the only you that even for. For even the Francophones in British Columbia, I promise you, they understand numbers in English. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, and and there are far fewer solely Francophone people in BC than there are Punjabi than there are like oh by by t probably more than one order of magnitude. I mean, it's not remotely close. We have the beloved Nigel Howard. That's my Nigel Howard impression. He's kind of always doing uh, American Sign Language. Amazing, like yep. But again. Translating for folks who can't understand. Where is the Punjabi translation? Where is the Cantonese? Where is the man? Or where are all these other languages? Korean, Philippine? Like I said, do, you got to do it all. And, you know, rolling it out a week later. Here's the other thing. Why are we not looking at why Richmond's numbers are so low 
And I think, I think we all know why. This is an Ian Young, uh, South China Morning Post uh, reporter. Uh, this is an Ian Young thing. Richmond's numbers are a fraction of the rest of the lower mainlands. Yeah. Like they are actually better it, than some it, parts it of Vancouver Island. Like a, it looks like a mistake when you see the yeah. map of the lower mainland. You literally do think there's a digit missing when it comes to Richmond's numbers. It's astonishing. Exactly. Why aren't we looking at what they're doing and figuring out what it is that they're doing different that Delta next door isn't doing it? Yeah. Like, it isn't the Fraser River, guys. There's something happening there. Now, my suspicion is, is it's a much more uh, intelligent masking culture. Uh, mm -hmm. But okay. Like, if they mandated but, masks... But if I that's what it is, that's great, because it's simple. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> like, I'm a pretty libertarian. I don't want a lot of government influence. But if the government says, hey, you know, for the next six weeks, we're all going to mask up. Everywhere you go, mask up. Just humor us. Mask up. Okay. I mean, it's better than being locked down. 100%. So this, these, are the, these are the issues that drive me crazy, and I, I just, I don't understand it. And then, you know, John Horgan is, like, backpedaling, like, oh, we'll try to get, you know, he can promise a thousand bucks for everyone, and I, but if you actually look at his promises for households making less than $125,000, but whatever. He's promised a thousand dollars by Christmas. The guy's already backpedaling furiously. Oh, I, we dare not get uh, MLAs together in this horrible environment. Oh, you know what? What could happen, dude? You've been meeting on. You've been meeting virtually for months. Yeah. You could do it with the lame duck group today. Like, this is not hard. It's well, and it's. I mean, there's a certain. There's an irony. Let's call it irony, where you. Uh, you know, they, they need this thousand dollars in every British Columbian's bank account before Christmas because it's crucial and there's a pandemic and there's a dire need. But we also can't do this before Christmas because there's a pandemic. And yeah. it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. So, again, for UBC liberals, it's been two weeks since the snap, only 206 more weeks to go. Yeah. And again, there's a way to do this. Without, you know, sounding like, you know, a QAnon conspiracy theorist. And uh, I, I point to, you know, Jordan's question about, you know, you know, the role of employers and, and working with them uh, as a, an example of a actually totally fair and constructive criticism of the type that not just can be raised, but should be raised yeah. right now. Like, there's so many questions, right? Like, so they cancel minor hockey games. Are minor hockey games that much more likely is there any science that shows that minor hockey games have resulted in any more outbreaks than minor hockey practices? The answer to McLean is no. There, there isn't. Around the world, like, no. And certainly no more than school. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, I'm not sure my kid's more likely to pick it up from a minor hockey practice where he's wearing a shield and, you know, yeah. like, you're passing. I just, but again, you know, I don't want to get into this thing where we're reflexively questioning everything Dr. No. Bonnie Nader Dix comes out with. But people need to use their common sense. And right now, my, like, there is no common sense in what, how this thing was rolled out in a lot of these you know, kind of contradictory rules yeah. for different, uh, different things. Right. We, uh, we ended up spending uh, much longer yeah. on this particular topic. <laughs> Thank you for watching our live real-time therapy session. That's right. Uh, but you, uh, there was one other thing you wanted to, uh, two other things. But yes, one other thing you wanted to mention. Yasmin Ritani. Ritani. Yes. Now, if you're watching this and you're a BC politics watcher, you may not know the name. She has been a, I admit, I had not heard the name before. She is a Toronto area liberal MP, uh, and she's in some trouble right now. Dawn Valley East, federal liberal. Um, it turns out for the past several years, she has been paying with House of Commons. That's your tax dollars, folks. Uh, House of Commons funds. She's been paying her sister to work at her office, which is a violation of the code of conduct and the ethics uh, of the uh, House of Commons. Worse yet, um, this is not some accidental mistake like, oh, I didn't read that one bullet point in the 70 pages you sent over. No, no, she yeah. actually knew it, instructed uh, her sister to disguise her identity, instructed other staff, uh, or used mm. a fake name on emails um, for this woman, and then instructed her uh, staff to uh, look the other way. Yes, uh, yes, but she was, let's just keep it quiet between us. Um, this has come out. Um, she has now had to step out of the uh, Liberal caucus, which is not a great thing to do in a minority government. She sits as, a, as an independent. No. Um, one wonders why this particular code of ethics, uh, <laughs> conflict of interest uh, infraction gets her booted out, but the leader of the federal Liberals, the fish rots from the head, as Norm Spector likes to say. Uh, <laughs> he's got two, he's working on his third violation. He's still the leader, but nonetheless, 
Um, your tax dollars at work, Yasmin's sister. Um, it's all just incredible. so tacky, isn't it? It's just so... I'm trying to think of a better word than mundane. I mean, there's no, you know, grand conspiracy here. It's just like garden variety palm greasing. Yeah. It's very uh, GTA politics, um, <laughs> which is greater Toronto area. It, it just, the story checks out is what I'm trying to say. It's so it's, entitled. Uh, it's like just another sign, like, you know, the federal liberals after the Chrétien Martin era swore it would be different. And it's not. It's worse. Like, like, I mean, it's maybe not worse than ad scam, but, you know, like just that sense of entitlement, like, you know, we know better and we can do what we want. Yeah. It's not great. I, I, when I first saw the story, I, I didn't real, I hadn't seen the details that, you know, she had instructed people to lie and use the, you know, uh, a false ID. I, I thought it was more like what you originally said, where she honestly just hired her sister because she yeah. trusted her sister and, and missed that. And I, I would have been, yeah, you should know better, but is it the end of the world? Not really. But I mean, you lied. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's... now, now they'll pull the thread, right? So now they're going to be asking questions. Was this woman getting paid more than a typical uh, office, considered office employee got paid? Um, what sort of benefits? What sort of perks? What sort of information does she have? Like, now the thread's going to get pulled out of the sweater, and I'm sure we're going to discover more and more uh, interesting things about this. And the best part is, uh, I believe she sits on an anti-corruption committee oh, in the House of Commons. Which wonderful. Is, <laughs> it's what just, a world. It's, is, it, is, it, is it the end of the world? No, but it's just, it's so... I, you know what? The best word is tacky. It's so tacky. The whole thing is tacky. Yeah, yeah. More it, time. Tacky. It's tacky. You're, you're right. I, I, I don't know, McLean. Like, what are we doing here? It's just, like, just be better. Politicians, be better. Like, we could go on, I could go on a whole rant about the uh, celebratory tweets over Biden's victory, which, which are fine. Celebrate Biden's victory, but don't belittle 70 million Americans who voted for the other guy. Like, just, guys, let's be better in our discourse. Please, I'm begging you. Let's just be better in our discourse. Let's be more ethical in the way we operate uh, with tax dollars. Let's make sure we're stretching every dollar as far as it can for taxpayers because it's a sacred trust and we're at a time in the economy and, and in Canadian history where government needs to stretch every dollar as far as it can. Let's quit playing us versus them politics, premier us versus them. Let's quit, you know, all that stuff. Like, okay, let's... Let's find, like, let's criticize ideas, not people. Let's just, let's just do better. I, I don't yeah. want to end up like America. That's the thing. No, God, no. No, not, yeah, God, no. Not at all. I don't I even also, know how to add wanna, on to that. I also don't want to end up like New Zealand, which is a coronation. So, you know. That's true. Can we find a happy um, middle? You, you had, uh, <laughs> you had one other thing you wanted to talk about after um, our Toronto area MP. And I apologize. I have quite forgotten what it was. I have no idea what it was, so let's just let's okay. get out of it, here. It's good. You are, it, <laughs> again, if you're listening on Spotify, you're missing Jordan has activated his... Two weeks his gone. ...glove, and luckily he's showing me two fingers, yep. which is one more than two you. Weeks. Two weeks um, gone. <laughs> 206 to go. We can do this. We can, we're going to make this, people. <laughs> Until next week. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, that glove is just cracking me up. It's a Until gauntlet! Next week. It's an infinity gauntlet! Until next week, he is a galactic supervillain. I am McLean K. Uh, thanks for watching. Happy politics.